Hi. Hi. Yeah. Okay. We are going to start. Good afternoon. I'm Carlos Minguez, and I'm really excited to present the third panel and the last panel, where we will, we will be looking at exhibitions that we have categorized as themed, which we have defined as those exhibitions that speak to articulate a thematic through the selection of material that supports a particular argument or provocation, implying the identification, location, and presentation of a heterogeneous work whose juxtaposition support the curatorial statement. In this sense, our first guest, Mirko Sardini, could certainly be identified as a curator whose work is located on the field of themed exhibitions. Shows like Sense of the City, 1973, Sorry, Out of Gas, or what is used here as a reference exhibition, Actions, What You Can Do with the City, all of them presented, presented at the Canadian Center for Architecture, are inspiring ex examples where the curatorial practice is understood as the tool to detect and present contemporary questions in architecture. Mirko Sardini is director and chief curator of the CCA since 2005. His research engages the transformation of, tra of contemporary architecture and its relationship with the city and the landscape. As director, Sardini has overseen the transformation of the CCA to address contemporary social, political, and environmental issues. Exhibitions by Sardini, at times in collaboration with Giovanna Borassi, in addition to the formerly mentioned, include Asfalto, Il Carattere de la Città, Out of the Box, Price, Rossi, Stirling, and Mata Clark, Another Space Odysseys, Greg Lynn, Michael Malzen, Alessandro Poli. He was editor of Casabella magazine, Lotus International, and served on the editorial board of Domus. Zardini has taught design and theory at architectural schools in Europe and the United States, and his writings have appeared in numerous journals and professional publications. His presentation will then be followed by the response from Sara Herda. Herda is the director of the Grand Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, where she oversees the foundation's grant making, as well as a program of exhibitions, lectures, and events. From 1998 to 2006, she was director and curator of the Storefront for Art and Architecture, where she produced over four exhibitions. Herda is active in the design community and serves on numerous advisory boards and review panels related to architecture, art, and design. She is currently teaching a seminar entitled Exhibiting Architecture, at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Her presentation will be followed by Toby Mayer, who unfortunately is not with us tonight due to an unexpected trip to Sao Paulo for the upcoming Biennale. However, we'll be presenting a video shot at that low 38, located on the Lower East Side. Toby Mayer is a critic and curator based in New York. While living in London, he co-founded the curatorial collective Dos Census and organized several exhibitions. In 2004, he co-founded the art space HTTP in London. Between 2006 and 2008, he served as curator of the Frankfurter Kunstverein. He also collaborated on Manifesta 7 as a curatorial advisor. Since 2008, he has been curator at Ludlow 38, the downtown satellite space for contemporary art of the Goethe Institute. Recent exhibitions at Ludlow 38 include Lara Almartegui, Guide to Wastelands of the Flushing River, and Tobias Putri, After Freyoto. Exhibitions we saw as particularly pertinent to this category complexities due to this content and unique format. The Q&A will be moderated by Mark Wasura, architect and theorist based in New York City. He's currently teaching at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where he's director of exhibitions and director of global experiments in art and architecture. He was curated and, he, and produced numerous exhibitions, including Dan Graham's New Jersey, Environments and Counter Environments, Experimental Media in Italy, The New Dimensional Landscape, MoMA 1972, and Operators Exercises, Open Forum Film and Architecture. Please join me in welcoming Mirko Sardini. So first of all, thank you very much. It is really a pleasure to be here today in a group uh, uh, in which we have uh, so many people who we are in depth with. When I say we, I say both the CCA and both Giovanna Morazzi and myself. 
people we have been working with, uh, discussing, uh, collaborating. And uh, what we did uh, in these years uh, is also the result of this kind of, of uh, uh, relationship that we have established. Also, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I remember some years ago with uh, Mark Wigley, he, we, were more or less, we were in the same space, speaking of the Living Archive. And I think that in a certain way, I consider this, uh, uh, the creation of this uh, uh, program and uh, the activity of this group, uh, a kind of unexpected but uh, must due uh, uh, consequences of that uh, primitive uh, project and idea. So having said that, uh, uh, I would like to reassure in a certain way uh, Barry, but uh, because of the idea of the thematic uh, or the survey, in a certain way action could be, be considered a survey. Uh, in a totally incomplete, uh, personalized, uh, subjective uh, survey. Um, the reason that we are so interested in a thematic uh, is, um, is always because it's very important what you do, but especially it's very important what you do not do. And uh, for us, it was very important in these years not to try not to do monographic exhibition. So, Whatever we did else, we call thematic, uh, it was a, a different way to rearrange uh, also individual presences, uh, like uh, different architects invited to work, but perhaps uh, two instead of one, around the theme and the problem. And the reason for that is because there was a deep uh, a reaction on our side uh, on the, the message that a thematic exhibition could have, uh, excuse me, a monographic exhibition could have conveyed in uh, these uh, last 10 years a about uh, the role of the architects, the figure of the architects, entering in a kind of a mediatic process that we didn't want to be part of. I know that you could do wonderful monographic exhibition and some have been done also at CCA, like the one of Herzog and de Meron, which was totally a, uh, how can I say, unmonographic monographic exhibition but uh, that I consider kind of exception. So the second issue is why this uh, theme? As you see here, uh, you see the publication of the, CC the main CCA exhibition, not all the CCA exhibition, but the one that generally happens in the large uh, galleries. There, is, there are all of the main exhibitions that had the catalog except one, which was out of the box, and that is uh, a something that we can discuss another time. Uh, what you see here is a sense of the city, which was an exhibition done in 2005, and it was true that it was uh, dealing with a kind of a sensorial uh, uh, rediscovering anthropological field. But uh, the, one of the tasks of that exhibition, one of the objective, was in a certain way to work uh, on the idea of sensorial experience as a way to uh, criticize the prevalence of the visual and a certain kind of visual in the contemporary architecture. Clearly an exhibition like that one was giving a very partial perception of the city. And clearly, if you speak of experience, you could be uh, associated to the idea of the economy of experience to the idea that you consider the Arba not mo anymore as a productive space, but only as a consumption space. So we thought that it was not possible to limit our uh, reflection on the city to that kind of exhibition and uh, to go on with a different kind of strategy in order to tackle such an important issue in the contemporary debate. That was the reason that came actions, what you can do with the city. This was again uh, some of the material related to the sense exhibition, sense of the city. Now, what was action? Action was in a certain way a, a survey uh, of uh, activities uh, which were taking uh, uh, place in uh, the contemporary urban environment uh, bottom up. Uh, it was again an implicit uh, effort to uh, mm, rethink 
of the role of the discipline and the architects and the urban planner in uh, the shaping of the discussion and of the real uh, form, started uh, uh, around the four vague themes uh, around which uh, uh, certain actions have been uh, recollected, the idea of uh, the gardening of the green, which is uh, so successful today in the city, the idea, this is an example, is one of the actions that we collected, uh, is the maintenance of the urban park uh, in, uh, in uh, Turin uh, through a very old system of uh, shepherds. Uh, the other was about the idea of walking the city. That was a, a provocative experiment of a, a, a Austrian engineer trying to demonstrate uh, uh, the occupancy, a rate of occupancy of a car of the space and how much uh, an individual in reality uh, could take uh, over in that kind of space as a pedestrian if he was considered equal to the car. It was about reuse, recycling, this is of course a New York example, but uh, it was not only the idea of food, it was also the idea of buildings, of un unoccupied spaces. And it was the idea of play. This uh, is a, a math project uh, in, uh, in England in which uh, uh, a very complex strategy of uh, activation and defense uh, uh, of a, a, a space was put uh, in place by the group MAF. So what uh, I'm going uh, to, to present today is in a certain way the um, history of this project from the inside uh, a kind of unfolding of the process from the inside of this exhibition. Um, don't worry because uh, alphabetically I'm used to be the last, so I know that uh, I have to be very short if I want the people to survive. So I have a kind of experience accumulated uh, in years of uh, school uh, attendance uh, uh, to be, try to be short to the point. Uh, so the, the MAF is a very interesting uh, uh, project because one of the problems that we had uh, was uh, we collected all these actions. This action in reality didn't exist uh, in a physical form. Sometimes there were a little bit of traces of them. But in reality, it, the problem it was uh, how you produce these actions in a physical space, giving them a physical form. And uh, so, for example, MAF, uh, in this case, uh, we add uh, some of the material, some of the masks used by the children when they were going around in order to pretend uh, to give back to the horses a space which was planned uh, not for them, and to have a mixed animal and children park in uh, England. But also there were some, in this case, very conventional architect material model. And uh, what we did in this case was, for example, to produce uh, posters, fake posters of the uh, event as if uh, it was uh, uh, produced, uh, generated originally by the authors of the project. Another problem was uh, with the Topotech uh, project uh, for uh, um, uh, these inflatable uh, uh, pink puff roll instant uh, landscape, which was uh, used, uh, were generally were a, a series of 23 used in a public space, uh, in public mm, gardens in, uh, in uh, Germany, public parks. In this case was very simple. Was uh, the real part of the objects, they were there, some of them, and they were used uh, somewhere at CCA, somewhere in uh, another space where the exhibition traveled, which means the Grand Foundation in uh, Chicago. And we can address the idea after. Other cases were the, uh, how you make uh, a website um, physical. This was a, a really a very interesting project uh, of a website which was uh, tracking availability of furniture 
in different places in different city uh, for people to take over them. And uh, it was uh, born as an individual website uh, for few people, grow more and more to different cities. So the real issue was uh, how you um, give a form to that. Uh, and it was uh, through the idea, of course, of the simulation of the three different cities with the three different uh, kind of uh, printing of the email and information that were exchanged in that case. In other cases, this is uh, the in Spain, the, the action was the idea to make the population conscious of certain things which was planned to happen in a certain space. In order to do that, uh, this group went around with these lamps to illuminate the space by the night. But the fact is that during the day, they were going around the city asking people to charge the battery to sustain their action during the night. So the idea was uh, to give, uh, and uh, here I enter to the point, uh, we mainly created uh, um, a lot uh, of uh, print material in the form of a newspaper size or magazine size, uh, avoiding the idea of the um, uh, creation of art object. We had uh, some of the material relics of the real action in place. And uh, this idea of the, of the uh, news given in a certain way was the one that uh, was uh, uh, very often used together with some videos in most of the cases. This is uh, the illicit stencil uh, um, save cyclist is this group uh, of uh, uh, illegal, uh, illegal group in Toronto who during the night uh, is tracing uh, um, bicycle paths uh, where the city does not make intervention. And uh, clearly uh, in the exhibition you can have uh, this kind of material, the original material, the sum of the test, uh, you have a video created with them. Uh, not uh, revealing the identity, and again, also in this case, you have uh, the newspaper. And uh, you have, uh, following the, the Lucius Burkhardt uh, uh, operation of years ago, this, uh, again in Germany, this idea of uh, using the movable zebra to protect uh, pedestrians to cross the streets, uh, which again was given the format uh, of the uh, newspaper or for the New York Times, and that was the one in which uh, we were nearer to the origi original because we could uh, uh, produce some copies of the New York Times, uh, but clearly framed inside another kind of newspaper. I am concentrating, of course, uh, on some of the problems that uh, we faced uh, with uh, some uh, of the action that uh, were missing um, a physical presence at that moment. And uh, of course, uh, Steve Alba, uh, you know that uh, he's a quite a famous person in the world of the skateboard. For years, uh, he flew over Los Angeles uh, uh, taking uh, photographs of possible location for uh, vertical skateboards and he sent us his documents of survey plan photos which we arranged and uh, we arrange uh, in uh, this kind of format. Now, why I do this kind of uh, uh, long story? Because one of the problem was that, uh, again, the status of the object, this, most of these objects didn't exist, have been created by us, was not that the point. The problem is that uh, some of these objects have been asked by some collectors to be acquired, but uh, uh, originally some all these objects were supposed to enter the collection. And uh, there is uh, an incredible uh, um, passive resistance of the institution to accept uh, this object as part of the collection. So uh, I have to say that uh, I'm mentioning in this case uh, a certain kind of uh, problems raised this morning, perhaps in the Kurt Foster mentioning of the different role of curators, institution, transformation, this kind of thing. Um, 
just showing uh, uh, some of the critical issues which uh, uh, some of these operations uh, they could create. The second point uh, that uh, is uh, uh, was addressed was uh, how to present this material. I think that uh, the Muntada comment this morning about installation was very, very clever. And uh, in fact, uh, very often, uh, not only in this case, but also in the case of uh, uh, journeys, when we work together with Martin Beck, in this case with uh, Andrea Sala, we like a lot to work uh, with artists uh, in the installation process. Why? This material was absolutely um, very poor material. And uh, the idea was uh, to find uh, a very simple way to display them but very, very precise. So we work with uh, Sala just to define the table or the horizontal surface, which was uh, not only a table, but was a, a surface of a certain kind, neutral, but uh, with a certain characteristic. And at the same time, to use the structure of the table to frame some of the material that were available. And this is some of these uh, problems that are coming from this kind of uh, installation process. This was a, a quite a self-referential system that was working in spite of the space where it was, because in this case it was uh, at, the, at uh, the Grand Foundation, and it was the same kind of display, even if the context was totally different. And I think that in a certain way the context was working much better at the gram than uh, at uh, the PCA, like this one. For example, these material were framed through the tables uh, things. Now, what you see here is another issue, which is uh, uh, the idea of the protection of the objects. So this material was in reality very poor. Um, some of them were directly accessible. We didn't think that all the material had to be directly accessible. So some material was protected in this kind of uh, flexi boxes, which were open. So it was more a way to give a different values to different elements, but not pretending this to have a status of an object, except for the idea of the most uh, expensive material in all exhibition was this velvet, uh, which was used uh, for the different kind uh, of uh, uh, presentations. The uh, other issue was the articulation of this system in the space, which means uh, which was the rhythm created by this kind of uh, horizontal surfaces <coughs> in, uh, the, in the organization of the sequence of the spaces. I hope you can read, but just to give you an idea, uh, that was, uh, uh, these were some of the room in which uh, we have been uh, working with. Now, this morning it was a very interesting point at the beginning uh, and the first section of the discussion about uh, small magazine and uh, exhibition. There was a kind of uh, um, uh, collapse of the two in this kind of a, a media issue, which I totally share. Uh, museum have always operated on a multimedia base. A catalog is part of this multimedia strategy as uh, the other publication of the institution. In our case, uh, the catalog was a little bit particular because it was also considering a, a poster as a cover of that. But what I want to touch, there was a creation of a website, of course, uh, because in reality what was interesting of this exhibition were not the 99 action which had been chosen, but in a certain way what was not there. So whatever was in the exhibition was a pure evocation of a possibility which was outside uh, that. So it was a pure metaphor, a pure uh, allusion to a possible operation. The website was a way to uh, announce this idea of the possibility, opening the website uh, to a enlargement of this list. And in fact, for a while, the website worked like that. 
it was collecting other possible option and operation. What I'm interested to say is not that, uh, not because uh, the project uh, developed or not developed, is because clearly I really think that uh, uh, all the museum are going uh, a very deep, uh, or the institution of this kind, uh, a deep, uh, like the university, by the way, are going through a deep process of self-analysis and rethinking, and uh, clearly a real uh, uh, direction that I see for the museum, so-called museum, is uh, more and more related to an editorial strategy, a large editorial strategy. I'm not the only one to say that, uh, because clearly if you look at uh, what uh, Tate uh, started to do, it's not only the small publication, it's the idea of the web uh, and the online presence, or the same declaration of the British Museum are going in this direction. More and more in the future, center, center museum, uh, uh, what we generally call museum, uh, will become uh, um, also not only, online uh, producer of online uh, high uh, quality content. Which brings to the idea of the problem uh, of uh, uh, education in a larger sense and perhaps of a conversation that has been raised this morning in a much larger sense because it will uh, question the traditional uh, um, one-way directive uh, strategy that uh, a museum and institution have used uh, uh, till now. Uh, this is uh, not enough in the sense that uh, uh, there, is a, 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 there are a lot of problems in, a day, in this process of rethinking of the institution. And uh, I give you an example starting from an exhibition like this one. Um, one problem is, uh, uh, how can I say? Uh, how much uh, um, this exhibition uh, is able to put in crisis the traditional idea of a collection in an institution, like CCA, how much uh, this exhibition has been successful uh, in uh, promoting illegal activities, which we had some troubles to do, because as an institution, you are uh, promoting illegal activities because most, a lot of these activities were guerrilla-based activities. And even in the tolerant Canada, uh, there were some uh, um, problems in relationship uh, to, to that. And uh, how much an institution, like in this case, in this exhibition, can be ironic or self-ironic uh, in the treatment of this material and in uh, uh, the definition of its own uh, statements and mandate. So uh, at the base of that, there is clearly a problem of power and control that is going back to the question raised this morning by, by Mark Wigley. And uh, I'll be very transparent with you. This is a, mm, to follow the discourse of Mark Wigley, this is a takeover of a small group over a larger institution and uh, uh, the effort is an after effort of contamination. The result will be only one, will be failure. Failure for two reasons. Failure because uh, you have no success, and that is one, a failure because you have success. And anyway, you fail anyway. It means that a phase uh, will be closed and something else will going to, to happen. So I think that in a discussion of exhibition, there is a lot of critical institution uh, problem that uh, have been addressed in the art field uh, uh, in the past. But uh, uh, I feel that also thinking at the MoMA uh, discussion before, there are a lot of issues that could be also interesting for the uh, architectural field. So thank you very much. Yeah, this
this side is what? Okay. This one is what you got. Okay. This one you want it? No. It's the other side. So there are images here. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think they might be a little bit. It doesn't look like they're they're all sh they're showing up the right side. Oh, here we go. Um, I love exhibitions. Anyone who knows me knows the me that I love exhibitions. Um, and uh, at the Graham Foundation, um, we brought actions. And I'm just going to flip through these really quickly. These are just installa very dark installation shots. Sorry about that. Um, we took actions in, in a program now. Um, uh, I came to the Graham in 2000, uh, 2006. This was my office at the time. Um, and I had the opportunity to remake the program um, and uh, essentially kind of tap into this unknown history of the Graham Foundation. Um, that uh, under John Intenza in the 1960s, they brought Architecture Without Architects from MoMA. The first stop on that t worldwide tour was the second floor of the Graham Foundation. Um, and one of the opportunities um, for me going from storefront to the Graham was um, to rethink the u that program and the use of the Nabiner House, a 9,000 square foot mansion in the Gold Coast of Chicago. Um, taking actions, actions was the third exhibition um, that we did, was purely strategic. Um, it enabled us, it was the only show we will ever be able to do likely with the CCA because it was not collection based. Um, it was, uh, since the day I got there, um, people know the Grand Foundation as a checkbook, not as a place where things happen. Um, so um, we are constantly uh, building an audience um, and actions let us tap into a range of ideas and work in Chicago, um, you know, artists, architects, activists, um, general public, and it was um, incredibly successful for us in broadening the audience. Um, I think themes, uh, which this section is about, uh, I mean, every exhibition has a theme, but in the, in the context that you're talking about them, of uh, the kind of group exhibition, they can also be uh, completely deadening. Uh, they can suck the life and joy and uh, sometimes anguish of being in the presence of ideas and maybe specifically things and environments. Um, and in a strange way, actions had all of these um, ingredients that a lot of the other exhibitions uh, that kill ideas have. I mean, it, actions did not show this work with an invisible hand. There, were, uh, there was a, a huge graphic presence. There were newspapers and captions and sketchbooks and these tables and more text. And you know, it, it was really um, miraculously, it, it failed to kill the work in, in the show. I mean, in fact, it created a portal for each one of these 99 projects. It allowed people in to um, the ideas and sort of sent them back out into the gallery, or sorry, in the world, not in the gallery. Um, we also found that people spent um, a good hour and a half, two hours in this show. Um, actually, I think with, with most of our shows. Um, um, I thought it was interesting for me to be asked to be on the, the themed exhibitions because I, um, when I think of the work that I've done in exhibitions, I don't think of, um, I, I haven't actually done very many group shows. Um, I also thought about um, an institution like Storefront. Sorry, my laptop was stolen uh, was stolen this week, so I'm navigating my new computer here. Um, oh, I'm going to get it, I'm gonna make it smaller. But I just wanted to show like what, what themes 
look like in different scaled institutions. I mean, I think that Actions was a radical show for the CCA in many ways. Um, the kinds of work uh, that was included, the kinds of objects specifically that were included. I remember having a conversation with um, Mirko about these beautiful, elegant tables, and in fact, it was kind of elevating what in another context might look like garbage, you know, into something that was um, consumable. Um, that, that would allow people into it. At Storefront, um, Storefront, I think, over its history has sort of fearlessly, um, uh, this is, sorry, you can't see all this. This is the archive project, which is online. Uh, DMZ, which was before me. Clear Space, an important show, which was before me. Um, uh, civilian Occupation, the Politics of Israeli Architecture, certainly a theme. This was a project by Adol Weissman and Rafi Siegel. Um, I'll, I have a long history of working with Damon Rich, um, building codes, building out programmable city, which you saw images of, um, urban renewal, a city without a ghetto, um, which I remember the filmmaker Jonas Mekis coming to the show and saying, what do they know about ghettos? Um, another project with uh, Julie, uh, Julie Art and Martin Beck, information, which took the production of poverty as, as a theme or as a topic. Um, uh, our own version of a survey, Architecture and Revolution in Cuba, uh, with uh, Eduardo Luis Rodriguez, a uh, Havana-based um, curator, Armin Linka, um, Se, Se Chong Myung's um, history images. Uh, and, um, and so I think that, the, the, that there is a lot at stake in choosing a theme um, and risk. Oh, sorry. Um, and I think that it, it does depend on your institutional, oh, I'm sorry about this the institutional context um, that you're in. Um, but I don't really do themes. Um, I do, I think, create a heterogeneous program um, in an institution, because being a director curator at Storefront first and now at the Graham, um, I guess I think, think of this at, at the scale of the entire program and the way in which you use exhibitions to juxtapose um, one another. I, I personally, mostly, at, both at Storefront and, and now at the Graham, work with living artists, architects. I, I am a strong believer in the monographic show or, or the project, and that the, the exhibition is a site of opportunity um, to produce a new work, to produce a project. I'm just going to quickly go through this. Um, this was a project with Cecil Baumond, um, and this project was used um, to, oh, I'm so sorry, you're so dark, um, uh, to transform this space that everybody in Chicago, if they knew it at all, knew it as an office, um, certainly not as an exhibition space, uh, where we produced um, a kind of major installation that transformed uh, the building. And it was strategically kind of used to, oh, so dark, um, to change the public's conception of, um, of the space and of the institution. Um, another project I'll just show you quickly uh, was by an artist, Felipe Dolzuaides. Um, it was a project about the art schools in the Cuban, um, the Cuban art schools commissioned by Fidel Castro in the 60s, never finished. This is Roberto Gattardi. The artist Felipe Dolzelaides is in the back. Um, Felipe followed um, Roberto Gattardi around for years, making a film about um, Gattardi's insistence on completing the uh, School of Dramatic Arts that was 60 or 40% complete um, when construction was ended. Um, each exhibition that we do, uh, we let the, uh, the exhibiting artist architect completely take over and transform the space. So we basically throw all of our resources at, um, uh, and that's both, you know, not, not only money, but, but the institutional cachet. I'm just gonna quickly show you the current project. In realizing a project, and, and I think that, um, Sorry, let me show you. Oh, no, I can't even show you. Sorry. Well, I don't have much space up here. Um, the 
that's a very different kind of relationship, like entering a relationship with uh, a specific artist or architect to realize a project um, is very uh, different curatorial project than choosing a theme and selecting words to, works to illustrate a thesis. I mean, you're entering into something, you don't know if you're gonna fail or if you're gonna succeed. Um, and, um, and I think that in the many shows that I've been involved in, um, you're, you're actively creating a kind of new primary source th that is to be interpreted. I mean, if uh, Yuta said that you were an opener, I think that I'm much, I'm, I'm a maker, an opener and a maker. I'm not even opening yet, I'm just making it and putting something out there that to then be interpreted. And I do think that you, you do need the people who resist on one side and the people maybe who make. I mean, it takes a diverse ecology of all of these people to actually produce this rich culture of exhibitions. Um, this is a project uh, by Ann Ting um, that we are doing in collaboration with the ICA in Philadelphia. Um, it is, Ann Ting was one of the first women to receive a fellowship at the Graham Foundation, of course known for her work with Louis Kahn. On the walls in the exhibition are pages from an unfinished manuscript that she produced as a research project for the Graham called the Anatomy of Form. And throughout the first floor are these full-scale platonic solids illustrating um, the theory that Anne spent her entire, and to this day, is still working on and obsessed with. Um, and again, used as um, uh, another way to present ideas and give people access to, to um, a specific body of work. Um, I think that a lot of times in exhibitions, institutions or curators use as an excuse what they think people can understand. Uh, I think that I learned very, um, clearly at storefront that the most challenging ideas were the ones that the public could most clearly engage with. Often, I mean, I think it's terrible to underestimate the audience because the audience often knows much more about the subject than you know, any one of you in producing the project. So a project like the politics of Israeli architecture clearly had a wide um, and engaged audience um, and here it was being shown in an architectural context. Um, and I think that that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Toby Meyer and I'm curator at Ludlow 38, the downtown satellite for contemporary art of Goethe Institute, New York. I'm uh, sad that I can't be with you today, but I'm very happy that you came to visit me here on the Lower East Side at Ludlow 38 uh, and visit our space. Let me tell you a little bit about the history of Ludlow 38 before I start to talk about um, a few examples of exhibitions that I thought could be re relevant for today's symposium. So our space here was founded in uh, 2008 uh, together with the Kunstverein in Munich and the Goethe Institute New York and uh, it is sponsored by MINI and Goethe Institute New York. Uh, the space was laid out uh, as a project for three years, um, working with different Kunstvereins from Germany. In 2009, we started working with the European Kunsthalle in Cologne, and in 2010, we collaborated with the Künstlerhaus in Stuttgart. So these are three very different uh, institutions. Kunstverein Munich has a very long history. It was founded in the late 19th century. The European Kunsthalle is a very young model, was based in Cologne as a, an attempt uh, to set up a new Kunsthalle in Cologne after the tearing down of the Halbreich Forum. And the Künstlerhaus in Stuttgart is an institution that was founded by artists in the mid-1970s in the city of Stuttgart um, as a project that also incorporated workshops. So 
possibilities for artists to directly engage with printmaking, for example, or uh, sound art or filmmaking. These three years uh, gave these institutions a very distinct possibility to program uh, exhibitions and projects, uh, talks, film screenings, educational events uh, in the city of New York and these exhibitions always came out of a reflection of what is happening in this city and those were not exhibitions that were transported here from Germany that had already been uh, you know, developed in the German context and then were just implanted here. There were always um, exhibitions that were conceived, developed for the city. A few projects uh, stood out during this time that I would say are more relevant within the context of the symposium. Um, but before that I would like to talk about the design of the space. In 2008 Liam Gillig and Ethan Breckenridge were commissioned to design the gallery here on Ludlow Street. And uh, Ethan and Liam developed um, a stoop in the front gallery, so it was a very distinct design where the visitor immediately upon entering was forced to step up a few steps and was finding him or herself on a platform um, that elevated him. And then this platform was slowly falling down again and you would come back to ground level and then you would enter the rear gallery which was laid out with a black carpet and had a sort of lounge-like feeling. After the three years we decided to uh, continue with the program here uh, of uh, Ludlow 38 as mini Goethe Institute curatorial residencies and uh, as part of this concept change now we are no longer working with the German Kunstvereins, but we are working with individual curators from Germany, German curators or curators living in Germany, that get the possibility to work here for one year. Within the change of the concept, we also uh, decided that we would need a new graphic design, we would need, or we would like to commission an artist for a new interior design of the space. So after long conversations with Liam Gillick, um, we uh, decided that we would take his architecture out and uh, I commissioned Martin Beck uh, to uh, come here for conversations and propose uh, a new design for the galleries. Um, that's why we came up with this idea of one connecting wall that connects the front gallery with the rear gallery. Um, we also uh, decided to have um, a display case on the north facing wall um, that would give us the opportunity and the possibility to present works um, uh, differently than we had done uh, in previous years. And behind me you can see a movable wall that uh, adds flexibility to uh, the way we present work here in our space. Um, now I understand that I was asked to speak about a couple of projects or a few projects that have direct repercussions uh, within the architectural community. Two shows was that I wanted to talk briefly to you about. Um, one, one of them is um, Lada Amasegui's uh, Guide to, Waste, to the Wastelands of Flushing River in Queens, New York, a project that we developed together with the European Kunsthalle Cologne in April and May 2010 and which this project here, this little booklet of Lara, resulted from. I personally met Lara in uh, 2006 already when I was first working at the Sao Paulo Biennium and Lara was working on a guide to wastelands in Sao Paulo. So we decided together with Astrid Wege, Rike Frank and Anders Kreuger from the European Kunsthalle Cologne to commission Lara to come to New York and to work with us on a new project that directly looks at the fabric, the environmental and the architectural fabric of the city. And Lara decided to work on the Flushing River uh, in Queens, in New York City. And uh, during several visits and many walks that she and us had there, she identified a number of sites, 11 or 12, if I remember correctly, uh, along the river that had that were left as, way, as wastelands um, in the midst of a 
very heavy industrial activity and in the midst of a regeneration process. And um, Lara was partly interested in why these uh, stretches of land were left undeveloped, why they were wastelands. Um, but she was also very interested in the beauty of nature, the beauty of uh, decay, the beauty of wildlife that was unfolding within those spaces. And so, uh, as part of her project here, there was a new slide installation, this booklet that we presented, um, and uh, a canoe trip that we developed together with Janet Kim, who is also at Columbia, and uh, Larissa Harris, who is a curator at the Queen's Museum in New York. Let me talk, tell you a little bit about the process of this. Um, as I said, Lara was interested uh, in, uh, in, in these wastelands and uh, she was interested in finding out um, their history, their present state and the potential future of these lands. So after identifying these lands, we um, Myself and Helga Jus Christofferson, then an intern here, went away and defined the lot numbers of these lands. And after defining the lot numbers, we were able to find out about the previous owners the and the current owners of these lands um, and could identify what has happened there in the past and what is the current status. It was, of course, much more difficult to find out about what these people were trying to do with these lands. There is a lot of uh, real estate speculation going on in the area and so it was uh, very hard for us to find out about potential futures. So after gathering all this data for Lara's project, we then collaborated with Lars Fischer from uh, Common Room Architects um, on, uh, on the booklet and Lars uh, kindly helped us editing the text for the book. So there were a number of collaborators involved in making Lara's uh, project happening, but this also allowed it or made it possible for us to learn each of us um, a lot about one particular part of the city that we didn't know so much before. And then, so to make all this knowledge accessible, uh, we had the idea to um, invite um, people from the art community, from the architectural community, from the wider community at large to join us for a boat trip that then happened during, uh, towards the end of the exhibition and uh, on the Flushing River. So together with the Long Island City Boat Club, uh, visitors had the possibility to travel along um, the Flushing River and um, with a guidebook in hand uh, learn more about these particular wastelands. Another uh, work that I wanted to talk about uh, briefly uh, was um, Tobias Putri's after Frei Otto exhibition that we developed here together with Axel Wieder from Künstlerhaus Stuttgart, also in 2010. And uh, we, together with Axel, we were very interested in the practice of Frei Otto, the German architect, and the Institute of Lightweight Architecture at the University of Stuttgart. Now, Initially, we were thinking about bringing along models of Frei Otto to New York or original drawings that would make it um, understandable for visitors the process of how Frei Otto was working with a soap bubble um, to conceive light surfaces. Um, during conversations with Tobias Putri, um, we learned that he many years ago did some experiments uh, re-drawing um, or re focusing on uh, Frau Otto's experiments uh, sculpturally. So we talked to Tobias and decided that we would ask him to um, take this to the next level and he um, created a number of very beautiful um, wire sculptures um, that we then presented in the front gallery suspended from the ceiling above a tank with soap water. Uh, soap and glycerin water, a mixture that Tobias had uh, experimented with, that he had developed. Frei Otto himself uh, had a little bit of a different mixture, but uh, I guess that also depends on uh, the, the, the models that you're suspending within this water. So, in the view I had the possibility in the front gallery to directly engage with the experiment and suspend these uh, very beautiful uh, sort of abstract uh, uh, models in, in, in this uh, liquid and in the rear gallery here, here where I am now we had a vitrine 
uh, on the left hand side and, uh, a, um, and a table on the right hand side within which we had presented the entire uh, collection of Frei Otto's Institute of Lightweight Architecture um, ELEC publications. So I think there were about 40 publications that uh, partly were in the between but partly were also accessible to the viewer where uh, the viewer could engage directly um, with the research that has happened there at the Institute. And um, again, like in Lara's case, we then um, uh, thought about how could we, you know, take this a little bit further, how could we try and engage a community that would not necessarily come to our gallery. And um, together with University Settlement here, not very far from here on Eldridge Street, we decided to invite a group of after school uh, kids to come here to the gallery and to engage directly with the exhibit but also with the ideas that Frei Otto had developed uh, at the University and at the Institute in Stuttgart. And so to, we brought along um, common room architects again and uh, Lars and Todd um, led a workshop where participants had the possibility to um, form with wire uh, very small sculptures, suspend them then into the liquid that we had in the front gallery and create very light surface structures. And those were then photographed by us, uh, printed out, and um, then each kid could develop from the photograph of its model a sort of three-dimensional no, three no, drawing or a structure that could resemble a building. Uh, so within two hours the kids uh, you know, we're thinking about different uh, ideas of three-dimensionality, of light surface, of uh, architecture, of building, and um, and then you know some of these uh, kids were interested in taking their structures home or um, their drawings home, and uh, there is some of the documentation of uh, of this project also on our website. I think this is perhaps where we are then also coming uh, full circle to. Um, to Ladlow 38 and the idea of the Kunstverein as a sort of self-organized uh, structure that uh, is in Germany member-based and here uh, based on a community that uh, we are in conversation with. Um, in, when we were working with the Kunstvereins in Germany, of course, there was a conversation going on between the directors there and myself and other, other people here in the city. Now uh, that we are a curatorial residency, I think Depending on each project, one is always looking for new partners that uh, one would work with. And um, so, um, as we have done in the past, where we have worked, uh, for example, du during Natasha Zadra Hagigian's exhibition, Fruits of One's Labor, um, with, um, with the Museum of American Finance on Wall Street, and uh, organized a tour there to um, a group of visitors uh, to see uh, and learn about uh, the crimes in the financial world um, or um, invited a, a former Wall Street trader uh, who is now at NYU to talk about proprietary trading. I think these are very um, uh, good possibilities to reach out to different communities but also to engage the art world viewer in um, you know, with knowledge of people that is not necessarily always uh, directly accessible and visible to the viewer uh, within an art world context. With that, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present um, a few projects here um, with, that we have worked on in the past uh, and uh, hope you have a fruitful encounters um, at the symposium and then you might come by here and visit us on the Lower East Side. Thank you. these on? So, uh, 
if Felicity noticed how late we are running, I note it with even more urgency, so I will try to keep my comments brief and, and keep the conversation moving at a swift pace. But first, I want to thank the students for setting this up, a sign of the remarkable vitality of this program, really excellent, and thank uh, Mirko and Sarah for their great talks. They slightly preempted my comments because I was hoping to pick up on Keller's use of slyness this morning by alluding to the sly intelligence of the institutions that had hired both Mirko and Sarah, a slyness that produces a kind of internal reorientation that may not have been fully anticipated by um, the institutions. And, and I want to return to what that reorientation means in my comments, but rather obediently, I have tried to come to terms with the topic of the thematic exhibition, and it's not really clear to me what that means. Of course, the theme is a term through which one hears the echoes of theme parks and all of the problematics of entertainment that most serious institutions at, if not avoid, at least try to negotiate intelligently. Um, and one also hears all of the prohibitions against the thematic um, from a period of literary criticism in the 80s and 90s in which the theme would precisely be the death knell that Sarah was alluding to in her own conversations about thematic exhibitions. But another voice in this is the um, astonishing figure of the curator Harold Zeman, who in talking about his Document of Five project, explained what he was trying to do. And in this exhibition, he differentiated Document of Five from a series of architectural, I'm sorry, of art exhibition typologies, which he lists as the one-man exhibition, which Sarah's favorite, the group exhibition, the retrospective exhibition, the accrochage, which is not a term I knew, which is a, he describes as a non-structured ensemble of work by several artists, the stock exhibition, which is the museum just putting its stuff in the basement upstairs in the gallery, the private collection, and the exhibition for representative purposes. And he compares Document of Five, or his ambitions for Document of Five, against those by saying that in contrast to those exhibitions, there are several new directors or curators that have tried to replace formal principles that have been adhered to up to now by those of content. The thematic exhibition is a result of these reflections. The whole of the material shown in an exhibition is determined by thematic content, which is derived from existing work or is formulated independently of already existing material. And so what Zeman is describing is how Document of Five in his own thinking is a thematic exhibition, and this is precisely what makes it radical. It's not driven by form. It's not driven by any of the inheritance of exhibition categories. It's driven by some new notion of a content-oriented exhibition that borrows its principles precisely from the work that it's exhibiting. And so it, he talks about an interesting circularity. So what I wanted to get to with the Zeman was this question of how within a certain context, the thematic exhibition, at least by him, was formulated as a radical project. And I was hoping to be able to ask as a, as a first gambit um, how both Sarah and Mirko might talk more about their own institutional practices and what a radical project might look like within them. But of course, they've already told us what that looks like. The Actions exhibition is, of course, a radical project, both at the Graham Foundation and at the CCA. So I'd like to alter the question slightly. I'd like to make it slightly more self-reflexive for the context of curating and ask a harder question, which is, if we know what a radical exhibition is within these contexts, one which denies not only all of Zeman's categories, but the monograph denies the expectations of the institution and its will to collection, denies a certain form of authorship that we might normally associate with the exhibition. How would you say for each of you that curating is implicated in this discussion? I mean, what 
are the stakes not of an exhibition per se, but of contemporary curating. If, the, if both of your institutions are somehow against their own histories, developing new agendas and new policies and new radical exhibitions, what does that mean for curating as a uh, practice? things. First of all, um, um, let's answer, frame in a little bit also in a personal history. Mm -hmm. I, um, I did some exhibition, but I don't consider myself a curator. Uh, and uh, I, when, at least when I arrived at CCA, I didn't want the job. And uh, I accepted uh, CCA only because uh, I thought it was a good platform uh, to develop a certain discourse on architecture in a certain moment. So, uh, having said that, uh, 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 I feel that you have to frame this also in a little bit larger context because, uh, uh, and I'll come back to the curating. Uh, if you analyze, and I'm speaking of architectural institution, who are the new directors or the curators in the last years in all the architectural institutions? You see that there is a strong overlapping with editorial background. And it means that uh, there is uh, a, a transformation which is based uh, on uh, intention that uh, uh, are driving, this, driving these people in uh, uh, accepting this position and in a total different uh, uh, attitude in uh, the framing of the responsibility in respect to a public discourse, which has a lot to do with uh, an editorial or a small magazine uh, uh, background that these people could have. Had. So I say that the idea of curating is clearly uh, in this moment uh, uh, rethought in our institutions from two sides. One, because uh, the, um, this uh, uh, arrival of a new group uh, of uh, people in different positions in the institution, both curatorial, directors, and uh, kind of things, which has completely changed the way to look at that. And the second, because uh, I think really that uh, we are facing today a deep uh, crisis of the institutions uh, uh, produced by so-called liberal democracy educational uh, process, which means university and museum are the two uh, most evident uh, of this institution. There is a big process of rethinking of that, and the curatorial uh, role inside that uh, is part of this process of rethinking. Okay. Can be rethought in a lot of different ways. So my, how can I say, ironic uh, reference to the idea of the collection was in reality an effort to underline to you that uh, even a basic thing as the collection, uh, because of the new things, because of the digital, because, because of the podcast, because of what is a content, what is a is under a deep uh, uh, transformation, uh, both in terms of uh, its definition and in terms of the use of that and the user of that, which means that uh, even if you want to link the curator to the idea of the collection, because the collection is going to, the idea of collection is going to change deeply, uh, you have also to rethink of the role of the curator. And uh, if uh, you are able to enlarge more the role of the curator inside the institution and to go further, the official definition of the curator as the official of a museum who is taking care uh, interpreting, uh, protecting, and collecting uh, uh, cultural artifacts. If you enlarge that uh, to the idea of interpretation uh, or uh, presentation of this in the new context, you realize that this editorial component at a larger scale is asking for the role of a curator to be totally different. Uh, it's been already mentioned by other people, the, the idea of education, the idea of the uh, online presence, the idea of publication at large. So uh, it's a very interesting moment. If you ask me which is the answer, I tell you it is not. There are a lot of experiments going on. And uh, um, 
I think that, uh, um, nevertheless, till uh, today, still the exhibition is an incredible tool which will not be substituted. So I think uh, there will be more and more, I think, uh, two uh, landscapes. One is the physical one and one is a more virtual one in which uh, the so-called curator will be called to uh, operate with different tools and different opportunities. I see, uh, in the, as always, a, a moment of transformational crisis are a moment of big um, mm, opportunities. I think that also architecture institutions are doing that a little bit um, after art institutions, they already started to do that. Uh, so you can also take advantage of the process already in place uh, in other uh, fields. That's all. Thank you, Martha. Sarah? Um, I think in a similar way, I've been always a director and curator, so always in this role of never having the luxury of ever thinking about one show at a time, but thinking about everything all of the time. Um, and, and similarly, I've never worked in a context with a collection, only when I worked with Mirko on this last show. I mean, so we've all, I mean, I've always, the, the storefront or, or the glam, it's kind of a Kunsthalle um, situation. You have no collection, everything is, is a kind of, um, from whole cloth each time, or, or through this network of um, uh, taking shows and remaking shows. Um, I think going from a place like Storefront to a place like the Graham Foundation, um, one of the things I immediately uh, realized, I don't think I ever took for granted, but a space like Storefront, you have complete freedom. When you have nothing to lose, then you go, you know, <laughs> you're willing to lose everything every single time, which is a bit <laughs> exhausting. And Eva, I mean, you're in the, you're in the beginning of it. Um, so you, um, you know, taking that kind of sensibility to an institution that on one hand is, um, you know, funding should be about risk, but had become risk adverse. Like, bringing the idea of um, creating a kind of free space or um, the, the willingness or ability to fail. I think that a lot, I think maybe a crisis in curating maybe now that there are fewer places that you can fail. So there's kind of fewer places to experiment that there's now, you know, kind of a, I mean, I didn't go to a curatorial program. I, I created one maybe. <laughs> my own education as a curator, I kind of, um, you know, being in a place like Storefront. So I think that um, of uh, kind of utmost importance is this willingness and ability to take risks and to realize that there are stakes and, and to, um, and not shy away from, from those, um, those projects that are, you know, skirting legality or, um, or um, current trends or styles or ideologies. So it turns out nobody is a curator. Everybody is <laughs> a director, no, a no, scholar, I, an architect. Okay. Officially, <laughs> I'm a curator. I am not training as Officially a curator. Officially, I'm not and never have been. <laughs> yes. So the theme is denial. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think I, I, I really do want to keep this going fast. So I'm going to turn to the audience for questions very quickly. But I, I just want to say that this, the issue of the status of the institution and what's, what's considered a risk at Storefront versus the Graham or the CCA versus Ludlow 38, I think these are all interesting questions, how one formulates the risk and how one produces the courage to take those risks within those institutions. Because I, I would say that the interesting self-reflexivity in the project you presented is that the action then has to act back on the institution and not just you know, it's not just representation of possible actions elsewhere and the question of how one formulates those actions that can operate externally and internally seems like a really fascinating question. So the curator is a figure that is not just representing to the public, but then, let's say, acting reflexively back on the institution. And that seems like a, a really interesting formulation of the political position of the curator. Um, but with that, let me open up to the audience any questions.
Um, I was going to ask this question actually at the, the last um, one, but because I started thinking about uh, the relationship and meaning between the word inventory and invention, but um, I actually, it led me to a question about the internet that sort of relates to what you guys are talking about. Um, I was thinking, you know, if the inventiveness, inventiveness of an exhibition kind of depended on its relationship to, to the past, inventories of the past, then should it in turn turn into an inventory um, itself? And the most obvious place for that would maybe be online. Um, and so I'm wondering, in relationship to the actions exhibition, would you see, um, you know, would you see an online platform becoming an extension of the exhibition in, um, in a radical sense, or is that possible? Or should it be like sort of, could there be a, a tab on Ubu Web that said exhibitions? Or is that something that's interesting in general? Well, we did uh, a small effort, but you know, the problem uh, is um, that, uh, um, and it was successful, uh, the kind of a small uh, micro website that we did. Uh, but uh, the problem is that uh, when uh, mm, all the institution is not uh, yet uh, ready to um, mm, uh, embrace a certain kind of strategy, this uh, uh, project uh, could survive for a while, could become an interesting experiment. But in order to become larger, uh, has to be a part of a larger uh, institutional strategy, which at the moment it is not. So I think that uh, in a sh short, middle terms, this project will uh, fail, uh, but it will be a, an interesting experiment uh, uh, in respect uh, to the possibility of the institution uh, in the future, which of, of course, uh, there is a, a conversation uh, strategy that has to be developed uh, uh, on, uh, online. And I'm saying this uh, simply because uh, being at the periphery of everything as it is Montreal, uh, it is, uh, uh, you are forced to think uh, in a certain way. You are th forced to think uh, of a, a media platform for what you do because you know that the uh, vis physical visitor to your exhibition will be always a very limited uh, uh, number of people. So it is uh, essential for the institution to think in this way for the future if they want to survive. I just want to pick up on that with something I think that we've been talking about, um, which doesn't have to do with the internet, but has to do with the, um, this kind of network of spaces that are producing programming. When I said that to do, to, to bring actions to Chicago was a strategic one, I mean, one of my missions with the Gram is to create a sort of you know, crassly put world-class space for architecture. And by um, working with an institution like the CCA, if a main space CCA show could go to the Graham Foundation, the Graham Foundation suddenly exists on a level and in a network of ideas and spaces, the same way that at um, Storefront we did an Eve's Klein show. Storefront should have never been able to do an Eve's Klein show, but, but we did, and, and, that, and, and all of these relationships um, also feed back into um, what the institution actually is sort of on the ground. And so I also, as a funder now, and um, have this very privileged position to know what people are working on, or, or you know, we, we see the projects and we fund them before they um, are realized, just understanding the wealth of um, ideas and resources that go into producing a project. So when something like Clip Stamp Falls, you know, is, is another one of these projects that you know, starts in a place like Storefront, goes to the CCA, travels the world, I mean, that there are so many opportunities, I think, to collaborate, to share, because like Beatrice said, no exhibition ever arrives in a suitcase. Each time you know, you, an exhibition lands or is put on in, the, in a different space, it does change the space, it changes the context, and the, sh the exhibition itself changes. So I take a lot of shows, but I never take it out of the box. I mean, I always use it as an opportunity to reinvest in the project to realize some aspect, to you know, make it new and work for in our, in our space or in our context. Tony? The, 
question of, of, of being critical within the institution itself and whether the institution itself becomes a critical institution and therefore normalizes the critical mm -hmm. is to me very par paradoxical in relationship to your uh, actions. I mean, I remember when they first did an exhibition of the, uh, the, the situationists in Boston, there was an extraordinary outcry by latter-day situationists um, because to exhibit situationism as an art project as opposed to an action, as opposed to a political uh, qu quasi-revolutionary or, or proto-revolutionary project was an abomination in the eyes of those who had participated in situationism as a, as a political project and to exhibit it. And I was wondering whether you, well first, whether you got, had any um, opposition from, the, uh, from those actions uh, that you, um, you know, picked up the detritus of and then proposed as an exhibition and therefore, in a sense, canonized uh, within institutionally the actions, even though critically the exhibition was a critical exhibition against exhibitions, which were not critical. Um, <laughs> uh, that was the first thing. And, and then, and then it, 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 it's, it's true that whatever is critical in one age is normalized in the next, right? That we're into the normalization of Dada, the normalization of every avant-garde movement gets normalized faster and faster and faster, right? Um, so Clip Stamp Poll absolutely revolutionized uh, the way in which um, uh, history uh, could be uh, un unearthed, uh, could be distributed, and could be uh, expanded as a project, and therefore I think revolutionized a certain form of uh, historical education and historical research. Fantastic, right? The next step, of course, will be to revolutionize that. And so the, the, it, it, it's a continual process, I think, uh, of uh, developing a, a, a enough of a cycle of, uh, of, of a critical stance towards exhibitions and exhibitionism um, to the point where that is about precariously to become normalized. And at that point, that's where a whole nother cycle has to start and a whole nother revisionism or critical structure. Even, you know, to return to the normal would be at that point critical. I just uh, would like to comment, Tony, what you said, the sense that um, what uh, we are doing is uh, a project which has um, mm, a limited uh, uh, time span. It is not a, a, we do not pretend that this kind of uh, a project that we are doing now, developing CCA, will go for a long period of time. The idea was uh, to have this project running for a certain amount as long as it was uh, recognizable and was able to produce a certain effects. But uh, as for the magazine, uh, there is a kind of, I think, um, timeline. And I think that the most, uh, I always uh, thought that the best was when uh, Cynthia Davison said, okay, any, it uh, is a project which uh, has to die in 10 years, so the death was already uh, programmed at the beginning. Well, perhaps it's too much, but I say that um, it's very important to understand that. And for us, it's a very clear time frame that uh, we can operate now in this way uh, for a certain period of time in that institution, in this context, in this moment of the debate, uh, that's what we think we can do. And after that, something else. But I think there's also a, a way in which certain institutions change is intrinsic to the mission of the institution. So in fact, each exhibition is an opportunity to change. Uh, it's a kind of attitude towards the exhibition. I mean, I didn't really talk in detail or any substance about the shows that I flipped through, but Felipe Dolzuaide's show, Utopia Possible, for me was a historical project. It was a, but it was a project by a contemporary artist about an architect living. So in my own, you know, I, I didn't necessarily articulate that in a kind of you know, curatorial statement, but the way that I thought that it um, operated in our program, that was the thinking behind it, to juxtapose that against you know, whatever had come before, whatever was coming next. served as a sort of productive constraint to a certain degree is one of the things that always struck me about Starfront is there's 
a, it's total lack of an environmental feel, right? It's a totally, um, as in a way, I mean, that's of course why you could never exhibit something from the collection of the CPA there. And um, it, it, what I find so productive about it is you have to generate a new source of value, right? There's no, because you can't actually um, display anything with uh, any, ex any sort of exchange value. Um, uh, but in this sort of new production of value, it, it seems that it's taken mostly a pedagogical um, value, and I was wondering if you guys have any, I mean, since you work with a, with a very precious collection and, and you essentially cannot um, because of the sort of constraints of the space, um, if, you, it, if that is something that uh, you're, you're always thinking of. I mean, I think everything is a limit. Having a collection is a limit. Have, not having a collection is a limit. I mean, Storefront had, you know, incredible limits, but, but each one of those things is an opportunity. And I don't think that it meant, you know, like I said, we showed Yves Klein, original objects. I mean, you could, you know, I think that each project you had to engage, you know, what was possible. That, that, you know, that it was always a constant like negotiation of what you could get or couldn't get or what, what, illust what kind of would best illustrate the idea. I know there was a project at the drawing center um, of Yona Friedman's drawings, but Yona Friedman's drawings had already gone to a collection and they probably couldn't, they couldn't get them anyway, so Yona sanctioned them using Xeroxes. Because in fact, I mean, that, that there are many ways to, you know, express and show ideas with integrity and it doesn't always mean that it's a, a kind of precious object. One feels a deep sympathy for the burden of the value of the collection. <laughs> Join the collection. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, you didn't give us the details, and I'm not asking for them, but the, so the, this sort of, um, you, you, you manufactured archival evidence of activities that didn't leave enough evidence for you to exhibit, so you produced sort of phantom evidence. And if I understood you correctly, now people from the outside of the museum want to buy that. Um, and people on the inside of the museum don't want it. Um, <laughs> and I suppose I want to know, uh, like, w how's that going? Like, are you going to just no? Uh, <laughs> like, like, are you going to? Are you going to? Because uh, of course, also some funds would be useful for you, right? Th so there, there is another component that would be interesting. Is that uh, in another exhibition? Uh, um, Sorry, out of gas. What we did uh, was, uh, uh, I think, the best uh, uh, work was uh, for this uh, uh, young guy to go every morning on eBay and to buy for one year whatever was available of uh, um, board games related uh, from a certain period to another period related to energy issues. And also with that, we had a lot of troubles to have them entering the collection because uh, the status of the object. For example, one part uh, of the collection of CCA is based on the fact that uh, the material, as soon as it's not part of the archive, but is an object, uh, has to be of a certain kind of quality. So some of this material was not uh, properly uh, preserved, was uh, damaged. So in a certain way, there are small clues of a, a kind of a culture, ex extreme culture of an institution, which is uh, very extreme because uh, if you analyze uh, out of the box that uh, you know uh, a little bit, it was an exhibition and archival material presented uh, on the walls. When you go to MoMA, you, or to Whitney, or I don't want now to make preference to Metropolitan, you have a painting and it's there. Sometimes there is a protection, fine. Sometimes there is a guard, okay. Sometimes there is a camera, fine. But uh, uh, just to give you an example, 
CCA, you had uh, to protect these uh, two or three times more than uh, at Mondo. Uh, uh, that is telling you uh, the problem of the culture of the institution, uh, but it, you also understand, perhaps if you go back, uh, why there was this excess, because when CCA was founded, uh, founded in the 70s and then made public in the 80s, there was uh, an idea that architecture was not recognized as uh, a serious discipline. There was uh, not as, uh, as intellectual uh, or not uh, with the same value than other disciplines. So there was the, in order to communicate that, uh, there was at the beginning the effort to, to treat an architectural drawing as an art drawing. So in a certain way, uh, you have always to frame uh, this kind of problem uh, in, a, in a context. So in a certain moment, there was uh, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, CCA was moving in a certain direction because the cultural context uh, in that moment was a certain culture, uh, cultural context, especially in North America. And then uh, this has been uh, fossilized for a long period. And uh, uh, you still uh, uh, face this kind of uh, situation uh, later in the small, uh, in the small uh, uh, actions. You still see certain things uh, persisting there. So just to touch, so that so the uh, passive resistance, which has been surely perfected in Canada, uh, <laughs> in all of its various forms. Uh, um, I mean, if I understand you right, Mirka, that. That in, because it's not a museum, right? It's a research center. <laughs> so, so, uh, for a research center to give its own subject, architecture, the dignity of a discipline, it produces an exaggerated version of museum control. So, actually, at the CCA, you have not only the protection and the guard and the camera and all the rest, but it actually that then presents a kind of fascinating laboratory because because w as we learned this morning, museums themselves are dissolving. I mean, particularly in Kurt's argument, are, are, are sort of dissolving, and museums are, if you like, enormously jealous of the streets and of the uh, Biennale, Triennale, da, 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 the whole the whole kind of e ephemeral occupation uh, of 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 art in urban environments, but also in, in urban environments, including media environments, um, understood obviously as ur as urban space. So, in a weird sense, in the very moment that the museums are just just filled with envy uh, of uh, what goes on outside their walls, and they visit, they spend a lot of money bringing experts in the outside, funky curators and so on, to try to pretend that the inside is now as interesting as the outside. C CCA ha has a kind of unique, is in a unique time warp, because it has preserved the idea of the museum. Like in the middle of all of this, it's not just preserving the artworks, the, idea of the museum is being sort of faithfully preserved, presumably so that that concept could be reused at some other point. Um, so in, in a way, I think this is a sort of almost a, a conceptual artwork. And definitely if you meet any of the security guys and girls at CCA, they are something like performance artists. There is just no <laughs> doubt about it. And so I sort of see you um, always with a slight smile, like now. Um, <laughs> You know why I'm roving, smiling? Roving because I this, uh, thought territory. that my new intervention would be security as a, a strategic uh, project, curatorial project. I, I just happens. wanted to bring more of a comment, like to follow it, what you said about Yuna Friedman. I mean, we experienced when we were working with Yuna that he just had thrown away half of what he did in his life because he had to give up his studio and he couldn't afford to bring it all to his apartment and nobody wanted it. And I think there is a slight difference in creating an architecture to art, because in art usually you can put the original in a museum. In architecture that's slightly different if you don't consider the drawings the original, but you consider the building the original. And I think there is a big potential in architectural curating, and that is that of preservation. And um, also, to, to claim that something is worth uh, to protect. And we just experienced like that major buildings, important buildings have been destroyed because in the US there is not the same kind of preservation than elsewhere. 
And I think there is a strong potential for your course also really to highlight important buildings and claim that they are worth to be collected. And it, it just comes as a comment because we're discussing what is inside, what is outside, what is an original, what is not. Because in architecture, I still think there are amazing buildings out there. They're really falling apart. Thank you. So I, I think we should move on to Felicity's final comments. I just want to finish with the um, discussion of the CCA and its security. Um, we all know the famous discussion between Caprao and Smithson in which Smithson defends the absolute nullity of the museum interior as its most interesting feature, a feature which he claims makes the museum interesting unlike the city. And as strange, he claims, as New Jersey. The CCA may be the only place in Canada as strange as New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Uta's comment, uh, we have a fantastic preservation department here at the GSAP that um, takes the curating in the sense of caring for, uh, for buildings very seriously and, um, uh, and very experimentally, which is not to say that, that my program SHU shouldn't you know, take this up, certainly it should, um, but to say that we have colleagues doing incredible work in that direction that um, are part of the conversation. So uh, I'm happy to do that. So I've been asked just to make um, a couple of closing remarks, and since we're already an hour uh, over uh, our time and, and, and drinks are waiting, I'm um, going to be very brief, but I did want to take the opportunity, firstly, to um, uh, thank uh, Jose and Carlos and Fernando, um, uh, and who am I missing? Jacob. Sorry, Jacob, um, behind, <laughs> sorry. Um, for you know, conceptualize or taking the initiative really to conceptualize this event, um, and uh, also to conceive of it not just as um, their event, but as a contribution to the program that that is ongoing. Yes, and so as Jose mentioned uh, this morning, this um, is seen as the as the first in a series that may well, um, uh, in, in future iterations, take other aspects of the program's concerns um, uh, to bear from. Uh, editorial work, uh, publishing works, even the formation of institutions, institutional questions, uh, et cetera, as their central, uh, central topic. And uh, these, as many of you know, we've been uh, discussing in terms of the sort of operating platforms, yeah, the multiple operating platforms through which uh, architecture um, uh, undertakes its, uh, its, its conceptualization, its uh, discursive sensibilities and, um, uh, and remain sort of information in a very literal sense. Um, so, and I also wanted to thank them for contributing then not only to the program, but also uh, to the school. Uh, and beyond that, uh, for conceiving of this event as a broader contribution to questions of, uh, of exhibition practice. And uh, as Mark reminded us also, uh, to curating and to curatorial practice. And, um, I was very pleased that, that Mirko, where is Mirko going? Mirko uh, announced that he doesn't consider himself a curator, and we've seen um, in almost every case people who have acted as curators, who have undertaken a, a form of curatorial practice, who um, are not uniquely curators. And I think I just wanted to, to stress in, in, in some senses that the goal of the program, um, uh, and also Sarah also made a, a remark about this. The goal of the program is not to um, professionalize curators in the sense of institutionalizing what it is they do or even where uh, it is that they might come from, but certainly to um, uh, maintain a level of critical interrogation about these questions, certainly to provide a, a pedagogical um, platform through which they, they might uh, you know, test out curatorial questions, test out uh, forms of exhibition practice and uh, and ask um, you know what other directions these practices might take. So literally, pedagogically, uh, it's a, a double-sided coin in the sense of you know understanding um, uh, the history of these practices and continually you know interrogating the uh, the potentials they they nevertheless um, harbor. So second, I wanted to um, uh, thank Beatrice for her fantastic. Um, opening keynote lecture and 
and um, for, um, for reminding us and, and stressing the degree to which the, the three key terms in uh, the program's title, critical, conceptual, and curatorial, are um, uh, inevitably inextricable, that they operate together, that these are um, divisions that, um, um, that you know, we hope don't hold <laughs> and that are supposed to um, sort of interfere and mutually reinforce even if for the sake certainly of, of pedagogy and of these events we make those distinctions or we make them uh, as sort of open distinctions. And, and also um, to uh, thank her for uh, introducing as um, as the Clips Dance Fold exhibition, you know, did right from the start, this, this um, dialogue, let's say, between uh, little and big, in that case magazines, but I think the question of small and large institutions and, um, uh, and positions has also been very much at play throughout the day and um, very productively framed through uh, figures like Gomez um, uh, having become, or actually AD, having littled itself and returned, and this sort of difficult status of, or the sort of differential status of, of um, the key protagonists in, in many of these fields. And, and so, actually, I was making a list. We've obviously had people speaking from uh, positions of, of larger institutions like Barry uh, at MoMA and, and Mirko at the CCA and major biennales uh, like the Biennale um, uh, Kurt curated to um, people Actually, and there's been an intense fluidity. I think Mark might have pointed this out. A couple of people, almost everybody has uh, passed through storefront or the CCA or Biennales. Yeah, I mean, this is, these are, again, distinctions that, that don't hold. But, but to say that, that I think it's important to, um, to uh, or I think that the, even the demarcation of these three, um, three categories of the, the, the thematic event, the, the survey event, and, uh, and the contextual event, uh, within each of these categories, again, there was a sort of crossover in terms of the, um, uh, the, the sort of institutional context and paradigms that would fit into each. Again, sort of refusing any sort of normative or clear, you know, definition uh, across these barriers. So we had visiting curators, we had uh, institute directors acting as curators, uh, we had traveling shows that, you know, are, are beyond any particular institution, but uh, nevertheless um, uh, speak back to them. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, though, I really wanted to acknowledge the generosity of um, uh, all of our speakers, and uh, especially um, uh, the, the curators who were put in the um, context often of revisiting work that, as Barry pointed out, seemed like uh, a type of ancient history, um, not only for revisiting um, their work, but for their slightly, for responding um, so generously to the slightly unconventional task of offering a sort of subjective narrative, offering a sort of inside story that would help open up um, uh, the nature of a curatorial project, how they develop, how they're materialized, how they're, uh, these are some of the terms that, that the organizers put on the table, how they're interpreted, um, yeah, how they're formulated to, to, to really help um, uh, render a sort of level of transparency. And I understand, of course, that that in almost all cases, these exhibitions were, were discussed uh, at the time in the, in the form of, of, a, of a curator's talk, but it is quite different to um, um, speak somewhat retrospectively a, about one's work and, and to you know, understand it uh, in that sense as necessarily part of a history, a history that's certainly important um, uh, to the program I direct and, and to the ongoing sort of practices that, that, uh, that it encompasses. And, uh, and it's a history too that in large part is not written and, um, uh, and sort of needs to be written. Pedagogically we face this all the time. But um, so I wanted to you know, thank them uh, for that and also to opening their, um, their projects then to a, a, a type of commentary that again uh, was staged as a type of encounter or open platform um, uh, with distinct voices, voices uh, who, uh, voices which may have come from other institutional settings um, or have had a very different critical or uh, intellectual uh, agendas. And uh, again, I think that that worked very successfully. I think as a conceit um, uh, that I would uh, congratulate the, the organizers and, and again thank all of the participants for um, uh, working with them in that regard. And you know, I know it's late, so I'll skip over. I was just going to say that clearly uh, a lot of evidence has been put on the table that 
uh, exhibition practice is indeed um, uh, still a lively you know, forum, site, um, uh, medium of, uh, for critical attention and for, um, um, for pushing the, the boundaries and uh, formulations of what architecture is and what architectural exhibitions are. Um, but I'll close much more quickly than I uh, intended to by saying um, that um, finally, just a, a final brief thanks, um, uh, I, and I know that the organizers uh, thanked, uh, made their own thanks in opening, but I also want to reiterate the thanks to, um, uh, to Joseph and, and Thomas for uh, being a key sponsor and also to the Dean and, uh, and the GSEP and the whole team at the GSEP for um, uh, helping them realize this project, supporting this project and, um, and uh, making it such a successful one. So now I welcome everybody to uh, drinks, which I believe are just outside. In the, in the Avery Cafe, and um, to thank you all for coming. So. <laughs>